As a bit of an advisory, this episode will be unkind to what we saw from Devin Bush in 2021, but it will not bury him or his future. Good morning to you. Good Friday morning. I'm Dayan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports. This is Daily Shot of Steelers. It comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into hockey and or baseball. I also offer up Daily Shots of Penguins and Pirates, the same place you found this. Let's get the facts out of the way first. Fact. Bush was absolutely awful this past season. He became such a weakness on the defensive front that Keith Butler and Mike Tomlin were forced to move their safeties pretty much right up into the line of scrimmage because he couldn't tackle, and really, for the most part, he couldn't cover either. Second fact, the Steelers would need to exercise a fifth-year option on him to keep from losing him, at least in a guaranteed context, and that option would cost upward of $11 million for one year. Third and final fact, they don't have any inside linebackers, like at all, because they're going to send Joe Schobert packing, and we saw what all of the various replacements for Bush and Schobert looked like. I, I mean, maybe you could hold out hope for Buddy Johnson, but if you're talking about Buddy Johnson as the entirety of your inside linebacker depth chart, then you've really got nothing, okay? I mean, I, I guess I could throw in a fourth fact, although this is more of an opinion than anything, and that's that this is arguably the weakest single position the team has, the one that could do it the most damage in 2022, even though nobody really talks about it, at least not compared to, you know, quarterback. Everybody wants to talk about the quarterback. What good is a quarterback going to do on a football team that can't stop the run? Remember Minneapolis? Probably the best game, certainly the best half of football, that Ben Roethlisberger played the entire season through some amazing passes, including, of course, the one that should have won the game. And some other good things happened offensively, and it didn't matter at all because Dalvin Cook ran for 5 billion yards. He ran at will. Haven't seen something like it happen to the Pittsburgh football franchise In decades, it was so bad that Mean Joe Green publicly called it out. This is the worst position on the roster. And it'll remain that even if Stefan Tuitt does come back, Tyson Alualu does come back, and all of a sudden the actual defensive front, meaning the defensive linemen and outside linebackers in the 3-4, becomes a strength again which it would in that circumstance. And yet, even in spite of that, even in spite of the massive draft capital that the Steelers conceded to move up and get Bush at 10th overall, there is no way, no way, Tomlin, Kevin Colbert, and Art Rooney should be coughing up anything remotely close to $11 million to bring this player back. It makes no sense. This portion of Daily Shot of Steelers is brought to you by Point Park University. Choose from nearly 100 career-focused programs leading to bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees. Choose when and how you'd prefer to do that studying, whether it's at Point Park's gorgeous downtown Pittsburgh campus, whether it's online, maybe a flexible hybrid format would work best for you. Find out more about all of this at pointpark.edu. The term investing comes up a lot as it relates to the draft. You'll hear that a team invested picks at a certain position. You'll hear that a team invested draft capital in a different type of transaction, such as the one in which the Steelers sent a third and a fifth rounder acquired in the A-B trade, to move up and get Bush. 
But there's another investment that comes into play, and this is the one that nobody talks about, and that is that executives, and in the case of the National Football League, head coaches, because they're very influential in this process, invest emotionally in drafts. They love to say that when a player gets to a training camp, in the Steelers' case at St. Vincent College, again, someday maybe, that all players have the same chance. They don't. They don't. It's not how it works. A first-rounder is always going to be favored. Why? It's like a favored child. They put a lot into that pick. They put their reputations into the pick. They put whatever arguments and deliberations they had at the table, at their own table, in their own draft war room, into that pick. If you could go back in time and do the whole fly-on-the-wall sequence for when the Steelers grabbed everyone's attention and stopped the draft cold, and that included... All of us watching, whoa, it was a big, big moment. I remember exactly where I was. I'm betting that you do too. And that's not something that's easy to let go. No matter how experienced you are as an executive or a head coach, no matter how unemotional you claim to be about decisions like this, it's human nature. And one of the fears that I have going into this offseason, especially with Colbert standing on his last leg, is that a priority will be given to attempting to salvage a pick in large part because of legacy. No one wants to have a Jarvis Jones on their ledger. Everyone wants to have a T.J. Watt on their ledger. Colbert made his stance clear. Uh, semi-clear on Bush earlier this week by saying that no decision, first of all, had been made on a fifth-year option and that he felt that Bush still had a recovery in him, pointing out correctly and fairly that other players who had come back from ACL surgery have struggled to regain peak effectiveness in the first year back. He made it clear that they believe in Bush, they believe in his future, but, you know, again, nobody has snapped up the fifth-year option yet. And going back to December, Tomlin made public comments about Bush uh, supporting him both in words and in deed, meaning that he spoke effusively of Bush being courageous for having come back the way he did and for not having held out, for having made himself available when realistically his knee might not have made that necessary. And indeed, of course, Tomlin kept playing him, at least for the most part, until it was painfully evident that Bush was just killing this defense. Here's my suggestion, and this isn't out of whack, I don't think. With reality, with emotion, with Bush's potential, and from Bush's perspective as well, talk to him. Talk to him. Tell him, listen, $11 million is awfully tough. We're not going to give you $11 million, but guess what? If you get cast off as a free agent, no one else is either. Might as well work with us. You know the coaching staff here. You know the players here. You know the medical staff here. You know the strength and conditioning staff here that's worked with you to rehab the knee. Hang around. Not at $11 million. Let's get a deal done. That, that's something that I would find palatable. I'm not going to hang a dollar figure on what that is. But remember that one of these facts was that this team has no inside linebackers, and they're not about to go out on the open market and sign two mega free agents to drop in at ILB. It's not going to happen. And I really don't believe they're going to draft an inside linebacker in the first round either, not with the sheer number of bodies that are still needed on the offensive line. So get something done. Find a way to bring him back, but my goodness, don't take that kind of bite out of the cap. When we come back, just one question. Welcome 
back. It's time for Just One Question, and that's brought to you always on this program by the personal injury law firm of Luxembourg, Garvin, Kelly, and George, LGKG. They represent people who are hurt in car accidents, who need assistance with workers' comp and medical malpractice claims. The attorneys at LGKG have been designated Super Lawyers, capital S, capital L, for the past 15 years. And yes, that is a real thing. The Super Lawyer designation is reserved for the top 5% of all attorneys in Pennsylvania. Learn more about them at lgkg.com or by calling 888-842-5454. And today's J1Q comes from Scott T. Garden, who asks, DK, do you trust the Steelers' track record on drafting quarterbacks lately? They probably have bigger holes to fill. I did this on purpose, Scott, meaning when I saw your question in the pool and then moved it to the top of the list to be on today's show, I had reflexively proceeded to start checking who were their recent quarterback draft picks. And then I stopped. That's what I did on purpose, meaning I didn't want to research it. I wanted to see how many quarterbacks I could think of off the top of my head that this team has drafted like in the last decade or so. And what I came up with was Mason Rudolph and Josh Dobbs. And if I'm missing someone, apologies to that someone. But that's your record. So what you're really asking here, Scott, because Dobbs was never drafted to be any sort of starter, is do I trust the Steelers to draft a quarterback because word emerged that they hung a first-round grade on Mason? That's got to be the question that you're asking. It just got to be. And I'm going to look at Mason and say that I don't have a problem with him as a draft pick. I don't have a problem with him being a third-round selection in the same class that they took one of his wide receivers in the second round, meaning James Washington, of course, with an objective, an internal objective, of also adding Mason if he'd be there in the third, because that's the way Mason fell on their own board. I really believe that a lot of football fans aren't aware of the hit-miss ratio of NFL quarterbacks in the actual first round, never mind whether the scouts hung a grade on them or anything. Even some of those taken with the highest picks, the Jared Goff types, don't make it. They just don't have it. And you really can't know that or fully find that out until they're out there, until they're in games. It's such an intricate position that it's so volatile to evaluate that it's that much of a hit or miss proposition, even with having an entire class to pick from. And as such, I'm sorry, I'm not going to look at Mason as some sort of bust He's got 10 results to his credit, 5-4-1 and one at that, and the one should have been a W had either Pat Fryermuth or Deontay Johnson not fumbled against the Lions in overtime. So he'd be 6-4 and four as a backup, and that's something that Colbert stressed when he was speaking of Rudolph earlier in the week. All of his action has been as a backup, including his long stretch of starting in 2019. And the reason that's significant isn't that, like the Detroit game, he found out the night before that he'd be playing. It's instead that there's never been an NFL offense in which he's operated that's been designed for him. Stop and think about that for a second. He's never had a training camp in which he ran anything other than a Ben Roethlisberger offense. He's never had a preseason 
in which he's run anything other than a Ben Roethlisberger offense. And even in 2019, because Ben's injury happened in week two, when Mason was thrown out against the 49ers in Santa Clara, California, later that week, there's no time to be re-diagramming a playbook. You can pick certain plays that you feel are a better fit for him, but it's not the same thing. It's not the same as having an entire offseason and an entire camp. Let me ask you this. What do you think are the things that Mason does well? Would it be that he's got a pretty decent and effortless deep ball, that he can be uh, accurate on intermediate passes? Uh, We've seen some of that in his starts. I'm thinking in particular of the one against the Browns to close out the 2020 season. We'd probably agree that he's got reasonable mobility, nothing spectacular, and we saw some of that even in his limited action this past season. And at the same time, he's got shortcomings. He hasn't always read defense as well. He gets strangely inaccurate or lacking touch on short, seemingly easy passes. And then, of course, there's the happy feet issue, which I believe He corrected and eliminated in 2021, but that's going to be open to someone's opinion. Why not just find out? Give him the summer. Give him the playbook. Let him make at least one NFL start operating a Mason Rudolph offense. Then we can get into the whole, uh, they can or can't draft quarterbacks. They never, to answer your actual question, to swing all the way back to that, they never, the Steelers, see themselves as being unable, uh, much less unwilling, to draft a certain position. And if anything proved that, it's that they kept right on drafting cornerbacks, didn't they? I appreciate the question. I appreciate everyone listening to Daily Shot of Steelers today and all week long. And we'll be back Monday with another one. 